Thank you. Um, great. So let's let's um, summarize a little bit where we were at last time. So make this little square we had before, and let's put the separation, your binary here. And the mass ratio here, so I'm going to put zero here, I'm going to put one here, I'm going to put another zero here, and I'm going to put infinity here. And so what I had told you before was that there's some regime over here where numerical relativity works quite well. And then there is this uh, regime over here where uh, cell force methods black hole perturbation theory, how it's sometimes called, works really well. So here you're expanding in Q much less than one. Here you're just doing a three plus one decomposition, so three plus one. And then there's this regime somewhere around here where post-Newtonian methods work very well. And post-Newtonian methods, these are methods in which you expand. I'm going to be very irritating right now because I'm going to write g much less than 1 and 1 over c much less than 1. Okay, so these are not dimensionless parameters, and so the mathematicians in the audience are probably cringing, but I'm going to try to make some of these statements a bit more precise and tell you exactly what we're going to be expanding about when we use post-Newtonian techniques. So remember this works provided um, the orbital separations are large relative to the characteristic length scales. Um, and I told you it sort of it does not work very well when you go to the extreme mass ratio limit. Um, so I'm going to be considering mostly what we call comparable mass binaries. So binaries with roughly the same mass, maybe off by a factor of 10 or so. And there's a long, long, long history to post-Newtonian methods. Um, like there is, <laughs> so the first person to do a post-Newtonian expansion of general relativity was Einstein, as far as I know. Um, so this dates back to like the 20s or 30s. Um, the theory has evolved significantly since then, and there's some really nice uh, references that you can follow or you can study if you want to learn more about this. Uh, perhaps the most well-known one or the most used one by experts in the field is Blanchet's Living Reviews in Relativity. Do you guys know what Living Reviews in Relativity are? Yes? No? It's a website. You just go there. It's published by Springer. It's living because uh, when they convince you to write one of these, then you're supposed to be in charge of updating them like once every three or four or five years. Problem is that nobody does. <laughs> so these are more like zombie reviews. They're sort of state of half alive, half dead. Um, anywho, um, so that's a really good one, and it's quite mathematically formal. I mean, people here, I think, would really appreciate Blanchet's treatment. It's uh, uh, quite rigorous, um, although perhaps a little bit compact uh, in terms of how much it explains things. If this is the first time you're hearing about post-Newtonian, what Planchet's review is perhaps not uh, the place to start. So there's this book by Poisson and Will that came out recently called Gravity. Um, that you can also use. And what's nice about this book is that it provides all of the gory details that you probably never wanted to learn, but you will probably have to derive if you use that book, up to um, formal one post-Newtonian or one PN order. Maybe they did it to two PN, I, I don't know. I think just to one PN. Um, also, there is a textbook by Maggiore, who uh, sort of introduces some of these concepts as well at an even lower level. So, so those are your references. Um, at Montana, I teach four semesters of general relativity, one of which is entirely devoted to half of this book. Um, so I'm going to try to condense that 
in 75 minutes, <laughs> and we'll see how it goes, okay? Um, so let's begin just to tie with uh, Piotr's uh, first lecture with uh, wave coordinates, because these are coordinates are used uh, quite a bit. So I'm gonna start by discussing the harmonic gauge condition. And this will allow me to introduce some notation as well. So uh, Peter told us that, um, you know, uh, harmonic coordinates are coordinates, so these are harmonic coordinates, are coordinates that satisfy this equation. Okay, so this box operator is supposed to be the metric contracted twice with a covariant derivative acting on your coordinates. And because this is a complete trace on this covariance, Peter also wrote down that this was equal to one over root minus g, the alpha of root minus g, g alpha beta, d beta, say x mu equal to zero. Okay? Okay. Okay, great. So let me now, and this, I mean, this should work in principle for any set of coordinates that you choose. Any x mu that satisfies that set of equations will be harmonic. Um, however, it is customary in post Newtonian theory to employ Cartesian coordinates for which, uh, so x, y, z Cartesian coordinates, or t, x, y, z Cartesian coordinates. Uh, for which this uh, derivative acting on x mu turns into a Kronecker delta. So now we have that this expression here turns into d beta acting on root minus g times g alpha beta has to be equal to zero. Which can also be written as the contraction of the metric with a Christoffel symbol by the way. Um, so what we do in post-Newtonian theory is we introduce a quantity. So this thing in parentheses here, this thing is gonna be called the Gothic metric. And I'm supposed to know how to write a calligraphic G, but I don't know how to do that. So it's an eight. So eight is calligraphic G, which stands for Gothic metric. And I have to put indices. So there you go. Uh, and so this thing is called the Gothic metric. Gothic metric. So your gauge condition becomes just d beta on the Gothic G. It has to vanish. Great. And so what we're gonna do in post-Newtonian theory is since we are in this regime where fields are weak and velocities are small, the space-time metric can be decomposed as the Minkowski metric plus a metric perturbation. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna introduce the metric perturbation. As H alpha beta is gonna be defined to be eta alpha beta. Um, minus gothic G, alpha beta. And with that condition, then the harmonic coordinate condition turns into a condition for the metric perturbation H, which looks like so. And we call that a gauge condition. So, or we call that the harmonic gauge condition. So these are sort of the tools that we're going to use. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take the Einstein equations and we're gonna plug in our decomposition for the metric over here. Well, we're gonna rewrite everything in terms of the Gothic metric and then decompose it like this and then expand and see what we get. Um, interestingly enough, uh, this is not quite what you would do when you do linearized gravity. So pretty much everyone here took GR1. And when you take GR1, it's almost compulsory to like do something in the weak field limit. 
Um, and so there you just say, oh, my metric g mu nu is eta mu nu plus h mu nu. And you just go and then you, you derive some equations for the, for the h mu nu and then you find that the trace reversed version of h mu nu satisfies some sort of wave equation and that's how you derive gravitational waves and blah, blah, blah. That's not how we do it in post-Newtonian theory. We work with this h mu nu. This h mu nu is not the h mu nu that you're used to. It's, a, it's similar at linear order, but it's not the same. So let's now think about how to connect those two things. Uh, I think I did it over here. Um, yeah, so I can, re I can invert this expression over here. Um, I can write g mu nu, at least to first order, root minus g of eta mu nu plus h mu nu. Um, now, g or minus g is just 1 plus h, where h is defined to be h mu nu, eta mu nu, so the trace with respect to the Minkowski metric. So I can plug that over here, and then I can linearize, and what I end up getting is that g mu nu is equal to eta mu nu plus h mu nu minus one half h eta mu nu plus order h square. And then you recognize this object here as h bar mu nu, the trace reverse metric perturbation. So the h mu nu that we use in post-Newtonian theory, it's, it's like the trace reverse metric perturbation that you would use in first, uh, I almost said first grade GR, but no, not first grade GR, uh, the first GR semester, okay? So that's sort of the mapping between those two things. So now let's, now that we've introduced a little bit of notation, let's begin, uh, like we should always begin with Landau. So let me introduce the Landau, Lando, Lipschitz, formulation of general relativity, and you will find that this Landau Lipschitz formulation is actually quite, um, oh, so I should have said that topic three here is comparable mass binaries, so comparable mass binaries in PN. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is introduce a Landau Lipschitz formulation. Um, so I've already introduced the Gothic metric, which is a tensor density, by the way. And there's this quantity, this awesome quantity called the H tensor. Really like this quantity. So this quantity is defined, so it's a four rank tensor. Okay, so it's defined to be two times two copies of the Gothic metric, alpha, beta, nu, mu, anti-symmetrized on these indices. So anti-symmetrized means you take that thing and then you subtract from it the same thing but with the indices flipped, nu and beta in this case, okay? Which I think has already been introduced in this school. And I like this because it turns out that this thing has the same symmetries in the sense of permutations, so permutation symmetries as the Riemann tensor. Wow, that's pretty cool. But what's even cooler, and I don't know how they did this in the whatever, 50s, 40s, 60s, whenever these people were alive and doing derivations. The second derivative, d mu nu, so d mu nu here just means d mu d nu, okay? Acting on this H tensor is equal identically and without making any type of approximation to two times minus the determinant of the metric times the Einstein tensor plus 16 pi. Well, I guess it's not too surprising that you get this. <laughs> TLL 
alpha beta. So what I am saying is that I can construct the Einstein tensor from just this very simple product of, of Gothic metrics or tensor densities, taking two partial derivatives, no covariant derivatives, I get ta-da, I get the Einstein tensor, but not so fast. I don't get the Einstein tensor exactly. I also get this other thing called T of alpha beta L. Yeah. No, no. This is in general. Um, I think. <laughs> I think it's in general. Because um, we haven't done, and if that's for me, just tell them I'm lecturing, and so maybe for next time. Uh, so TLL alpha beta, it's called the landau lifshitz pseudo tensor. The pseudo tensor, because it's a density. And uh, you know, I've written a lot of horrible things in my last two lectures, especially in the first one, I like wrote the full Kerr metric in its gory detail. I, uh, I, this is where I draw the line. I am not going to write down the full <laughs> London Lipschitz pseudo tensor. I'm just gonna tell you that this thing depends on derivatives. First derivatives of the Gothic metric. For example, there's this term. Plus like another 30 terms or so all of which depend on the square of first derivatives of the Gothic metric. So in some sense, we've separated all of the second derivatives of the Gothic metric um, onto this term, and then we've compensated to, to adjust things by subtracting these extra terms that, that depend on first derivatives. So yeah, so now I'm pretty sure this is zero. Because now what I can do is I can take that my Gothic G alpha beta is eta plus or minus h alpha beta, then I can linearize in h alpha beta because any derivative of Minkowski is gonna vanish because we're working in, uh, the Peter call them, the non-stupid coordinates uh, where the metric of Minkowski is just one, 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 minus one, or minus one, 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 one. Um, so these things, they just become derivatives of h, and then whenever I have a, a a, a divergence of that, then I can impose the harmonic gauge and like kill a bunch of terms. But this is, this is the formulation of GR. <laughs> okay. Um, and something else that's sort of cool, um, I guess I'm gonna write over here, is that, well obviously since this is true, I can now use the Einstein equations to re-express G alpha beta in terms of the stress energy tensor. And so the Einstein equations that you know and love, G mu nu equal eight pi T mu nu become D mu nu, so partial derivatives on this tensor, alpha mu beta nu equals 16 pi minus G times T alpha beta plus Lando Lipschitz alpha beta. Those are your Einstein equations now. Okay? So if we've isolated the second derivatives on the left hand side, and then on the right hand side we have the matter fields, and then we have nonlinear terms that depend on squares of first derivatives of the metric. And what's sort of cool is that this thing is. Uh, totally anti-symmetric on any three of its indices, just like the Riemann tensor. So I can take another partial derivative of this entire equation, and the partial derivative, if I take another partial derivative of this thing, so d gamma mu nu, or sorry, let me call it d alpha mu nu of h alpha mu beta nu, this will be identically zero because the partial derivatives commute, and that's a perfectly symmetric uh, type object, and it's acting on a quantity that's completely anti-symmetric on three of its indices. Which then implies that d alpha 
acting on this thing, on minus G times T alpha beta plus T alpha beta, and the left sheet has to be zero. Which is like your Bianchi identity, but just written in terms of partial derivatives, yes. Impose the gauge condition yet. That's the same thing that that guy asked. <laughs> What's your name again? Huh? I heard Gollum, but that's going to be right. <laughs> um, okay. So so now that we have that, oh, so you know, this is how you would derive conserva <laughs> conservation equations or flux type equations, um, which I'm not gonna do right now, but whatever, it's fine. Okay, so now, now let me begin to, to, to expand in H, right? Now let me make this assumption that, um, so 3.2, what I'm gonna show you now is the relaxed Einstein equations. Okay, so condition A, we're gonna use harmonic coordinates. Meaning box on X is gonna be zero. I'm also going to use, in addition to that, even though this is not said, I'm gonna use the good coordinates, the one where the I Minkowski mean, metric is minus one, 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 one. Um, and this, as I said earlier, will lead to uh, the condition D beta acting on gothic G alpha beta has to vanish. Then the second thing I'm gonna use is the, I'm gonna introduce a metric perturbation. That's how I relax things. Okay, so again, uh, I'm gonna use that H alpha beta equal eta alpha beta minus gothic G alpha beta, um, and so this condition, these two, then become just d beta on h alpha beta has to be zero. And I'm going to now use that condition. And if I do that, then the second derivative of this h monstrosity is equal to minus box sub eta of H alpha beta plus H mu nu D mu nu acting on H alpha beta minus D mu H alpha nu D nu H beta nu nu, sorry. This is exact. Okay. In that I have not perturbed in H yet. That's what I mean by it's exact. Um, and now I'm gonna call this thing here, I'm gonna give it another name. I'm gonna call it 16 pi times the metric determinant times a quantity, I'm calling tau alpha beta sub h for homogeneous part, that's what this thing is. And with that definition, my Einstein equations become the following. We have box, oh, I didn't say this. So box eta is supposed to be um, eta mu nu d mu d nu with partial derivatives, just like a standard uh, Dalimbertian in flat space. Yes?
this, this H tensor? Okay, so what I've done here is I have uh, taken this H tensor and I've taken two derivatives of this H tensor, um, like at this level, okay? Um, and then I have replaced for uh, G alpha beta, H alpha beta minus H alpha beta, taken the partial derivatives, the two, the two partial derivatives, and you get this expression. So what I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna move this so I'm gonna set this equal to that, and I'm gonna move the box operator to the left-hand side and write down the field equations, okay? So the field equations then become box on eta of H alpha beta equal minus 16 pi tau alpha beta where tau alpha beta is defined as, uh, what is it defined as? Minus g t alpha beta plus t Landau Lipschitz alpha beta plus t homogeneous alpha beta. Okay? Ta-da! So these are called the relaxed Einstein equations. And they're called relaxed because I've isolated the box operator on Minkowski on the left-hand side and move everything else to the right-hand side. And everything else to the right-hand side that I have moved is not now just uh, nonlinear terms that depend on the square of first derivatives, which is what's contained here. There's also some second derivatives that come from the homogeneous terms that appear here, okay? But I've done this because we are obsessed in physics with the green function for the flat space <laughs> inversion, because we know how to invert that, okay? Of course, if you're going to take everything into account, you cannot just simply invert it because on the right-hand side, you don't just have matter fields or like a source, you also have H. So now, if you want to solve, you do have to use perturbation theory and you need to begin to drop terms, okay? But up to here, this is exact. But in a gauge. So, exact in quotation marks. <laughs> I guess it's still exact. I dropped anything. Uh, okay, good. Are there questions up to there? Have you seen this before? It's pretty cool. I don't know. It's good. It's good. Great. Oh, and one other thing. Since, since I have this equation and I can now, right? I can now, what can I do? What would you like to do to this equation? Obvious thing, one more thing to do. Also on the, in one of the boards, I'm not gonna tell you which one. Although I'm indication in directionality with my hand. <laughs> no? No one knows what to do with this equation? There's one more equation you can derive from this equation. Okay. Yeah, more or less, something like that. So what if I take a partial derivative of this thing? If I take a partial derivative of this entire equation, since these are partials and partials commute and this with respect to Minkowski, I can take the partial inside. But the partial inside is zero because of the gauge condition, which then means that the partial on tau has to vanish, okay? So as a corollary of this equation, if you want, the alpha of tau alpha beta has to be zero. Which is, in post-Newtonian, we sometimes call this the Bianchi identity in a huge abuse of notation. <laughs> okay, now, you know, yes. G. No, just G. Because I want, I want to move this 
uh, or minus j. No, I think I think it's, it's plus j. Yeah, yeah, but there's an extra factor of minus g here, and there's a minus sign here. So I think they cancel. Also, you know, plus minus. I mean, if Piotr is allowed to put plus minus, I'm allowed to put plus minus. <laughs> no, but I think this is right. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So, um, right. So we have this equation, we have this equation, right? So in GR, if you're doing um, fluid mechanics, have you done fluid mechanics in relativity? Maybe? No? Okay. So the equations of motion, how do you derive the equations of motion of a fluid in GR? What you do is you take your stress energy tensor and you take the covariant divergence of that stress energy tensor and that you can show gives you the, the equations of motion. So in the same spirit, this equation here tells you how the matter sources are going to move. But not just that, right? Because this thing here, this tau, contains things that depend on H. So in some sense, this equation is also telling you how the gravitational field back reacts on the, on the motion of the, of, the, of the particles, or the point particles. But of course, these are coupled in some ways. You, you want to solve this, you're going to invert this with the Green's function. This thing is going to depend on the position and the trajectories of the point particles, or the war lines, if you want to call them that. But you don't know what those are until you solve this equation. So, okay. So now, so now, let me, let me tell you how we solve this equation. Uh, how can I erase, can I erase this? Okay. So, in order to solve this equation, as I said earlier, or I anticipated earlier, we're gonna use Green's functions. So the formal solution. is that H alpha beta just minus 16 pi box eta to the minus one acting on tau alpha beta. And so we write this down as four times the integral of a Green's function, I'm gonna call G, which has arguments X and X prime, acting on tau alpha beta with argument X prime of d for x prime. And so the arguments here are supposed to be four vectors, blah, 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 right? Hmm? Yes, very good point. So if tau alpha beta didn't depend on h, this is how you would solve it. Yes? Okay, so now let's look at what tau alpha beta is here. Tau alpha beta, I was gonna say this in a, in a little bit, but can say now. Tau alpha beta depends on the stress energy tensor of your objects plus uh, this Lando Lipschitz term and this H term. Let's look at the Lando Lipschitz term. It's over here. This is just first the derivative of H times first the derivative of H. So that's H squared. It's of order H squared. Well, times two derivatives, but still H squared. Over here, we have the homogeneous piece, which is this last term in tau alpha beta. It again depends on h times two derivatives of h. So again, h squared. On the left-hand side, I have something that just depends on h. So this is linear in h. So what we're gonna do is what's sometimes called a bootstrapping scheme. We're going to expand and solve this equation order by order in h. We're gonna assume that h to leading order is proportional to capital G and then it has a correction of order G square, another correction of order G cube, and so on and so forth. And you're gonna use capital G as your perturbative expansion parameter. And so if you do that, you find that these terms here are of order G square, like Newton G square, and the same as those terms over there, which means we can drop them, and then the tau alpha beta just depends on uh, the stress energy tensor of the matter sources that you have which you then have to prescribe. You have to have some sort of description for your matter sources as well. Uh, well, the stress energy might depend on G. 
not on H. So, so in some sense, it depends on H implicitly, but again, if your stress energy sensor depends on, on G, you would do an expansion about Minkowski and you would just keep the leading order part of that. That's, that's correct. So I will get to that in, in, in a second. Yeah, yeah, so in order to solve equations like that, typically the boundary conditions are prescribed at scribe plus. You're assuming that you have no incoming radiation from infinity, um, and so the radiation is purely outgoing. But l let me continue because this will come into play in a second, and if I don't answer your question by the end of the lecture, you can ask me again then, okay? So, so if tau, tau doesn't depend on H, then you get something that looks like this. Um, and so this G here satisfies the usual equation that you would expect. Box equals to minus four pi times a direct delta of X minus X prime. Um, so the Green's function clearly is just delta of T minus T prime minus X minus X prime divided by X minus X prime. Okay, so that's a Green's function. Okay, so now let's apply our, apply our formal expansion and I'm gonna show you what the general procedure is to solve these equations. So you start, so this is a general procedure. So you, you start by expanding H in powers of G. So what you have is something like H alpha beta equal capital G times K1 alpha beta plus capital G square times K2 alpha beta plus dot 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 up to the nth term, say G to the n K n alpha beta. And then there's remainders of order g to the n plus one here. I'm gonna be super formal, okay? So this expansion in powers of g is supposed to be understood as uh, a Taylor series essentially about weak gravitational fields. So when we say expanding powers of g, what we mean is we expand really an expansion in, you know, weak gravity. So if your gravitational field is, for example, described by some Newtonian potential phi that is equal to G times maybe some mass divided by C squared times R, then this quantity, which is dimensionless, is assumed to be much less than one. Okay, that's what we mean by an expansion in G. You always have to multiply the capital G by the right factors that enter your problem to produce a dimensionless number. But this notation has become standard, so we're gonna continue using it. So you expand in powers of G, and then you insert that in this equation, and then you solve this equation order by order in powers of G. So to zeroth order, Um, you have, you know, that K zero alpha beta, which I didn't even write down, is zero, and that G alpha beta is just Minkowski, and that's pretty much it. Like, you don't even have to uh, solve this equation. Tau, um, if you want to go to next order, you're gonna need to know what tau is, so t tau alpha beta at zeroth order. Um, is equal to the matter stress energy tensor alpha beta evaluated on the metric 
which is going to be, uh, let's say, eta mu nu in this case. Okay. And so, if I w so once I have that the metric at zeroth order is Minkowski, I can go and I can calculate what tau alpha beta to zeroth order is. Uh, clearly, tau L, L and tau H vanish, and then this T, which is in principle a function of G, becomes the matter stress energy tensor evaluated on Minkowski. Um, now, if I wanna go to next order, what I, ha what I hit here, in some sense, there's a capital G floating around, if you want, okay? So, if I wanna go to first order, the equation I need to now solve is box of um, K1 alpha beta has to be equal to minus 16 pi times tau zero alpha beta evaluated on eta, which again is just minus 16 pi of the matter, stress energy tensor, evaluated on Minkowski. Okay, and this is box acting on eta. Okay. So I've canceled the G, the capital G that would appear on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side here. Okay, so I'm working directly with K, yes. This, this one? Which G are you talking about? This one, this one, this one? Oh, this one, that just comes from the Einstein equation. So I, in a somewhat confused uh, derivation, I had set G's and C's to one for like a good solid chunk of the first half of this lecture. So if you look here, when you substitute in for um, T alpha beta, here, there is a capital factor of G that I didn't write down. not in front of TLL, that's, that's correct. But TLL is of order H square, and H zero is zero, because the background is Minkowski, so it just vanishes. So if you want to be more precise, put the G in here, and then make you happier. Okay. Um, all right, so we are here now on this equation, and this equation is essentially what you solved in first semester GR. Okay, it's box of trace reverse metric perturbation at order G equal to some source, which we typically put in some sort of like point particle stress energy tensor evaluated on Minkowski. Yeah, I know there's three questions. <laughs> um, which you can then solve through the inversion of this Dunham version terms of Green's functions with a suitable choice of boundary conditions, which I'm gonna describe in a second. But before I do that, there are two questions. Yes. Good, so the question is, is this valid for asymptotically flat spaces only or can one extend it to the CEDAR, for example, or ADS? Everything I'm talking about here is for asymptotically flat space times. Um, I don't know of any post-Newtonian development that has been done for anything but uh, asymptotically flat, with the only exception of maybe the work of Ashtekar and Bonga, who started developing PN theory with the Cedar boundary conditions. I think the Cedar, yeah, with like a small positive cosmological constant. Was there another question? Yeah. What I mean, what I mean is that typically the stress energy tensor, well, it depends on how you treat the matter stress energy tensor, right? So the stress energy tensor um, has been treated differently for different, by different uh, relativity groups around the world. So 
Luc Blanchet and Thibaut Damour, when they, and Guillaume Fay, when they developed the post Newtonian approximation, they uh, model the matter sources by uh, point particles. So there's some m, and then there's integral square root of minus g times uh, a Dirac delta function uh, d tau, like I showed in the previous lecture, I believe, when I was talking about Embrace. And then that introduces some issues with um, divergences that arise at higher post-Newtonian order that need to be regularized. So when I, when I said, so okay, so, th so that's one description in terms of Dirac delta functions, okay? Another description is in terms of fluid spheres. So that's the work of Clifford Will and Alan Weisman and, and others. So what they do there is they say, okay, the stress energy tensor is, let's say, a perfect fluid, okay? And you know the stress energy tensor for a perfect fluid, it's rho u mu u nu, uh, or rho plus p u mu nu minus p g mu nu, okay? And what they do is they say, okay, each of these dense, each, each of these objects, because we're on binary, each of them is a binary, is, is, is a perfect fluid ball with some radius, okay? Where the radius in principle is some sort of arbitrary parameter. And then they do the entire calculation. They have to do a matching calculation, but at the end of the day, at the end of the calculation, all of the terms that depend on the radius of the object better go away, or otherwise your expression depends on on the finite size or the finite extent of your object, okay? If it doesn't depend on the finite extent of your object, you can effectively then take the radius to zero and it's like you have a direct delta function. In that sense, is that the two approaches become equivalent. Okay, so now, <laughs> to answer your question, in both of these descriptions, the stress energy tensor depends on the metric tensor, right? So when I said you take the stress energy tensor, the T mu nu matter, which is a functional of G mu nu, and you evaluate it on eta mu nu, what I meant is that every time you see a G mu nu, a metric tensor entering into your description of the stress energy, you replace that G mu nu, that metric tensor by the Minkowski metric. Sorry, that was a very long-winded response. <laughs> that was a complicated question. You guys ask really hard questions. Uh, yes. And I'm gonna delay the answer to your question again <laughs> because I think I'm going to talk about that, okay? Um, all right. So, so that's what you do to first order. And then you can solve this through Green's function. So it's a Green function approach here. And then that, in principle, gives you K1 uh, alpha beta. And from K1 alpha beta, you can get now the metric perturbation G, well, the full metric G alpha beta, which is now eta alpha beta uh, minus K1 alpha beta. And from that metric perturbation, you can now evaluate the right-hand side again, so this tau alpha beta. It's now evaluated on this G1. What I mean again is that it's a functional of the metric, so you replace the appearance of the metric by this G1 mu nu that you just solved for, and you iterate. You just go around and around to higher and higher order. And if at any point you need to know what the motion of these objects is, what you do is you write down an equation for the divergence of the tau alpha beta. So, so world line, world line, so z say alpha of tau, you can obtain this thing by looking at the equation, say, tau beta, d beta of tau alpha beta at some pn order. So let's say g uh, mu nu evaluated at the n minus 1th order. You set that to 0. 
And what that gives you is an equation that sort of looks like this, d2 of tau for the eighth body in your binary, d tau squared, it's equal to something of order g plus something of order g squared plus dot 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 something of order g to the n minus one, in this case, which is a very complicated differential equation. It's essentially Newton's equation of motion, but with higher in g corrections to that, induced by the modifications of uh, the, well, the modifications introduced by the curvature of space-time induced by both of these objects on, on Minkowski space. Um, and you solve this, you get z of tau as a series in n and in m of not just powers of g, but also powers of c. So you do a slow motion expansion. So it is really this bivariate expansion in weak fields and in slow velocities that defines what we mean by the post Newtonian approximation. So when we say Pn, what we mean is an expansion, expansion in both weak fields and slow velocities. Okay. Now, in order to solve these integrals, a lot of technical details need to be worked out related to regularity of the integrands. It's essentially everything that you were asking. <laughs> and boundary conditions and things like that. So let me tell you what approach people typically take to deal with integrations like this for a binary system. So I'm gonna follow here what Will and Wiseman call the Dyer approach. which stands for direct integration of the relaxed Einstein equations. Okay. So the first thing you do is, well, you consider your binary system, right? And you center the binary system. You put the origin of your, or, of your coordinate system um, at the center of mass of the binary. So let me call it zero here. And then there's some radial direction. I'm working in Cartesian coordinates, but you know, just consider uh, the radial distance from the center of mass out to spatial infinity. Let's call this infinity. So this is just like a space-like uh, hypersurface, if you want, in your manifold. Joseph, for one instant in time. So at some fixed instant in time, um, right. There's going to be some region that is sufficiently close to the binary where a set of approximations are valid, and a, this, and a, and a region sufficiently far away from the binary where a different set of approximations is valid. So let me call this separation lambda characteristic, which for a binary system is gonna be roughly the wavelength of gravitational waves emitted by the system, which is roughly the orbital separation, which I'm calling B, divided by the orbital velocity, which I'm calling V. So let me make here a little drawing. So, I don't need that anymore. So, my advisor, Ben Owen, when we were doing this calculation, we call this the 
right egg diagram. And then when we finished the paper, he took me to a breakfast place to have sunny side eggs. It was quite fun. Um, so, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna paint the two black holes here. So there's one black hole here, another black hole here. And, and then there's some separation between these two black holes or these two bodies, they don't have to be black holes, the separation is B. These objects are moving some velocity, V1 and V2. So there's some characteristic velocity associated with this orbit. So for, for simplicity, let's consider, um, let's consider a uh, circular orbit. Okay, it's a circular orbit. And then, if this is the central mass, let's say the central mass is here, there's some distance over here, let's say, that corresponds to the characteristic wavelength of your binary. So I can create a circle around the distance, okay? So for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna paint the black holes yellow. Okay, and so the regime that is between this lambda and some minimum distance, oh, I also need to define a minimum distance, okay? So here's the horizon, right, of the black hole, that's the white line, but let me define some other two sphere here. Okay, it's a two sphere inside of which I'm not going to evaluate fields because if I try to evaluate fields, everything diverges violently. So I'm gonna cut that out from my domain and I'm only gonna look for solutions that are outside of that domain. So this is terra incognita for post-Newtonian theory. Okay, and what this radius is, it can be you know a few m or 10 m, or it's some number of m away from the horizon. Exactly what that is is not known because the series the properties of the series are not entirely clear. But what you can do is you can compare your post-Newtonian solution to numerical relativity and ask, you know, up to how close can I evaluate my metric and relative to my, like, you know, when does the post-Newtonian approximation stop being accurate relative to few, uh, few numerical simulations? And you find that the distance between the horizon and this radius where, um, that I painted here is a few m, depending a little bit on the system, All right? So then the regime that is between lambda and the origin minus the orange, the, the purple balls, that regime we're gonna call the near zone. Okay? And the regime that is outside of lambda we're gonna call that, in a very clever choice of terminology, the far zone. Sometimes people call this the radiation zone, sometimes they call it the wave zone, whatever. Near zone, far zone, okay? And this is why they, you know, he took me out to eat some uh, fried eggs because it sort of looks like fried eggs, right? No? With two yolks, yeah. Two eggs, like you break them together and then you put them on a bed of french fries. It's like favorite food, right there. Anyway, um, what was I saying? Oh, right, so you divide this region and so you're gonna employ, so let me just put in some characteristic distance here. So what we're gonna do is, uh, what did I paint, blue and green? Okay, so blue and green. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna use some approximations from here to here, roughly, so these are the near zone. And then we're gonna use a different set of approximations, like from here all the way to spatial infinity. Okay, and we're gonna call that the far zone. Okay, and then what we're gonna find is that because everything here is asymptotic, there's a regime roughly between here and here buffer zone, where I can expand both approximations. I can expand the far zone approximation about this edge 
and I can I expand the near zone approximation about the search, and th that double those two double asymptotic expansions are gonna be asymptotically equivalent in this buffer zone region, which by, this, by itself is a, is a shell, right? You're supposed to imagine rotating this. Okay, so in this shell, space-like shell, a spatial shell, then the two approximations need to, need to work. So when you impose boundary conditions, you impose boundary conditions on sort of the far zone metric. Uh, so you impose no incoming radiation conditions, say here. And here you impose conditions such that this metric asymptotically matches that metric in this region. Okay, and then here um, you have to be careful about the regularization of certain terms because uh, when you treat the stress energy tensor as point particles, then at some post Newtonian order you're inevitably going to run into uh, integrals that are highly divergent. Okay, like integrals um, dr, say, of one over r to the four, or one over r to the five, or to high power. And if you formally extend, like you do in the post-Newtonian treatment of the French group, these integrals all the way to zero, then you have, you have singularities here. So in order to remove the singularities, you can use things like Hadamard Partifini, or you can use dimensional regularization, is what people are using nowadays. Um, that's where you do these integrals in d dimensions, and then you take the limit as d goes to three. Um, so I am, there's no way I can discuss any of that, but just not enough. Um, all right, so um, how much more time do I have? I lost track. 10 minutes, right? 10 minutes, okay, I can go a little bit longer, okay, good. So what's sort of nice about this is that, remember these integrations, that I sketched over here, okay, they're over the past light cone about any you know, field point you're at, right? So if you wanna calculate the behavior of the field at a particular field point in space time, then what you do is you need to integrate this uh, on, the, on the past light cone about that point. That's the retarded Green's function, right? And so if I'm gonna go and split my domain into a far zone and a, and a near zone, Essentially, I'm gonna have like an integration over a subset of this past light cone, and then another integration over the rest of the light cone, okay? But if I am very close to the binary, like within a gravitational wavelength, then one of the nice approximations that you can make is the following. making a mess, okay. So, right. So the near zone is defined to be the regime where R is much less than this characteristic wavelength. The far zone is defined to be the place where R is much larger than this characteristic wavelength, okay? And then, if you look at the retarded time, which is gonna look like, you know, it'll be something like T minus R, something like that, then clear that tau R is gonna be much less than lambda C in the near zone, and tau R is gonna be in principle, much larger than lambda c in the far zone. So whenever you have a field, let's call it A, and you calculate R times the partial derivative of this field A dt, if A, which is typically a wave, is varying uh, on, a ta on a length scale of lambda, then this is roughly R A over lambda c. Um, but this, because there is an R over lambda C, and in the near zone, R over lambda C is much less than one, this is much less than A in the near zone, right? So from that expression, you can derive that dA dt divided by dA 
the, any spatial coordinate, I'm gonna call it xi, must be much less than one in the near zone. Okay, that is to say retardation effects in the near zone are subdominant. Retardation effects cannot be ignored in the far zone. Okay, so if you have a quantity in the near zone that depends on retarded time, then you can expand that quantity. Uh, you know, if you have t minus r, you can expand it about t. And so it becomes a, qu a quantity that depends on, on, on t minus r becomes a quantity that depends on t plus derivatives, right? If you do the Taylor expansion. So f of t minus r becomes f of t plus f dot of t times um, r plus dot dot dot, things like that. Roughly schematically speaking, okay? And so this is a series of approximations that you can make in the near zone. You're essentially taking, if you wanna think geometrically, this integral that was supposed to be over the entire past light cone, and you're considering this, the part of this integral, so the part of this light cone that is in the near zone, and it's supposed to be this sort of inclined subsurface, and then you're just essentially representing that as a Taylor expansion about t is equal to zero. So you're bending that surface back to be normal, plus corrections as you go. Um, so those are techniques, for example, that you use a lot when you, when you invert this D'Alembertian and you have this x minus x prime in the denominator and you sort of do progressive expansions. In the far zone, it turns out you can do a formal multipolar expansion in powers of g and get the exact solution exactly. Um, so then at the end of the day, once you've solved for the fields in the near zone and in the far zone, you sort of reconstruct everything You reconstruct the metric perturbation, and so you write h mu nu is equal to say h mu nu in the near zone plus your h mu nu in the far zone. And you um, work with that quantity. You, you calculate observables with that quantity and so on and so forth, okay? So just to give you an example, once you have uh, this, metric this metric perturbation, you can construct the plus polarization of the gravitational wave, which is essentially some projection, I'm gonna call P plus uh, JK, acting on the metric perturbation HJK. And what you get for a binary system is something that looks like two times a quantity called eta, times the total mass, times dl, times a quantity that we call x, times things that look like h naught plus h one half, x one half, plus dot dot dot. And here, Eta is called the symmetric mass ratio. Which is just M1 times M2 divided by the total mass squared. Then M is the total mass. So just M1 plus M2. DL is the luminosity distance, so it's just the distance for us. And x is a quantity called m, well, that's defined to be m times omega to the two-thirds. So m is the total mass, and omega is the orbital angular frequency of your binary. So if you wanna, this is essentially our post-Newtonian expansion parameter, the slow motion expansion parameter. There's a capital factor of g here also, uh, hiding. So why is this an expansion parameter? Because omega by Kepler's law to like leading order is say the mass divided by the separation cubed to the one half. 
So then m omega, or x, is um, m um, over b cubed cubed to the one half to the two thirds, right? Because there's a factor of m here, so if you put under the square root, it becomes m squared. So m squared times m is m cubed divided by b cubed, everything to the one half. And then I have conveniently put this to the two thirds. That's how I defined x. So then this quantity is roughly m over b. But m over b, that's the mass, total mass divided by the orbital separation, which by the virial theorem is roughly v squared. So you see that this is really, as written here, an expansion in powers of v, where this is your controlling factor, and these are the higher order corrections. And this is some functions that I didn't write down that depend on the orbital phase of the binary and things like that. And so there's this annoying thing in the literature that relates to post-Newtonian counting that you should be familiar with. And I promise, like, I'll stop here because I know that everyone is still trying to digest fluid and beginning to, like, doze off. Um, but people talk about 1pn calculations and 2pn calculations and 3pn calculations all the time. And I sort of feel like you need to know what those are, even if you decide not to work on post Newtonian theory ever. Okay? So a term of npn order is one that scales as v over c to the 2n relative or with respect to its controlling factor. The controlling factor in this case is, is, is this x, right? Is, is the thing that you pull out um, at, new, at what we would call leading order in your series, okay? So this goes as m over dl, so it has a power of g here, and then there's a v squared over c squared, okay? But this term that's proportional to v, so this, this goes as v squared, this goes as v, okay? So if I just keep on going with the series, there's gonna be an h1, that goes as x plus dot, 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 okay? So this would go as v squared, right? This term that goes as v squared is called 1pn order, even though there is an x over here. And in absolute ordering, this times that is x squared, which goes like v to the four, which might lead, it always leads students to think that that's 2pn order. It's not 2pn order, it's 1pn order. This is half a pn order. This is zero pn order, also known as Newtonian, but that makes no sense, you're gonna say, because that's a gravitational wave. There are no gravitational waves in Newtonian theory. Do not blame me for the nomenclature, <laughs> okay? But that's how, that's how it's done. And the controlling factor changes from quantity to quantity. So for example, if you calculate the rate of change or the binding energy of your binary system, E dot, which is also the power emitted in gravitational waves, uh, if you work in this long enough, you know that this is 32 over five times eta square times v to the 10 times a series that looks like one plus something here times v square plus something here times v cubed plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, so that's the amount of energy that's taken or carried by gravitational waves. You probably calculated this in your first semester class. It is the squared of the third derivative of the quadruple moment. So I triple dot squared. Okay, that's what you do if you, if you calculate, this is what you get if you calculate that. This term goes as v to the 10, so you might think, oh, this is 5pn order. This is Newtonian, because that's a controlling factor. So this term one is Newtonian, this is 1pn, this is the 1.5pn correction, and so on and so forth. Okay, even though this v to the 10 is different from this v square in this quantity. Okay, and I think, um, Probably gonna stop there. I just wanna mention before we go that a big elephant in the room is that I'm supposed to be talking about black holes. 
and I've sort of excised from my domain the black hole. <laughs> so the lecture tomorrow is going to be about how do we deal with that, with that region, the black hole region. Okay, thank you.